Welcome to the live stream demonstration of the Medical Ceramic Oxygen Generator, MCOG, uh, Oxygen Generation Project. My name is John Graff. I'm coming from NASA's uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And my name is John Tilka. I'm here at the White Sands Test Facility. And we're all here at the White Sands Test Facility, yes. right? We're, we're, we're yes. demonstrating uh, the MCOG here in the chem labs at, uh, at NASA WISTIF. Um, so, you know, we're glad you could tie in by live stream. Um, w when we advertised the system, we said that we would break the world record for the amount of oxygen produced by this technology, these ceramic ion transport membranes. And, and I'm very pleased to say that, uh, that we're, we're making lots of bubbles here. And, uh, and so, so what, we're, what we're looking at right now is really two pieces of test support equipment and four amazing little cell stacks that are inside that use this ceramic ion transport membrane technology. And so inside this box, there is a fan, a set of heaters, and these, and these four cell stacks that are producing the oxygen, which comes out this pipe and, and through the system and, and runs through here. Um, in the back of the wall, uh, thanks for everybody at the White Sands to make sure that the uh, electrical connections were all up to, up to, back and up to snuff. Um, there, are, there are two electrical outlets that draw about the amount of electricity that a hair dryer uses. And, and the electrical uh, lines go into this piece of, of ground support test equipment, which provides the power supplies and the data and the control and the, and the management of the heaters and the blowers and the cell stack, and also the instrumentation. This is a research device, so there's a ton of thermocouples and pressure measurement systems. That's all recorded in this device. From the perspective of the big metal box, there are two power cords that go into the system that power the heaters and the cell stacks, and then a set of power cords that uh, provide the data and the instrumentation, which are logged and tracked by this. Um, we're at the White Sands Test Facility, and one of the things we want to do is measure the oxygen purity. And so, I'll, I'll just before I turn it over to you, I'll, I'll call out that each of the four cell stacks are, can be individually addressed, and the purity measurements that were done yesterday have a short, direct, clean feed from the oxygen uh, produced by one of the cell stacks directly through a transfer line through some gas management into a set of gas analysis equipment. John, do you want to describe that? Sure, yes. Um, so at the White Sands Test Facility, uh, we specialize in, uh, in testing of all kinds of different hardware for space flight. Uh, my group in particular is the, uh, uh, the NASA Center of Excellence for Oxygen Safety. Um, our group was started after the um, Apollo 1 and, uh, and some other fires that had happened in spacecraft. And so we, um, we do all the, the testing for uh, new, new hardware that, that NASA is interested in for, um, for spacecraft. Um, we uh, have a lot of analytical chemistry uh, devices and analytical chemists that can do uh, e extremely precise measurements of gas quality uh, for, for flight hardware. And so we're bringing that to bear on, on this technology as an independent verification of the, of the purity of the gas. And actually I'll turn it over to uh, one of our analytical chemists to, uh, to talk to the, the analysis. Uh, this is Elias uh, Ramos Miranda and here he is. So we're here in the White Sands uh, Gas Lab and currently we are employing three different methods and uh, various analytical instruments here to test the output of this device. And although data is preliminary right now, uh, it certainly appears that the output is exceeding medical grade quality, uh, which is to say it's exceeding 99.0% in purity. Thank you so much. We're going to transfer the mic and move the cameras right now. And uh, you know, please remember, this is a chem lab, not a film studio. So, so we're going to move this over. I'm going to introduce you to um, Dale Taylor, founder of American Oxygen and chief architect and builder of this system. And while we're moving the camera, I, what, we're, what we're trying to do here is that the chassis too, and it's a big metal box you can't see inside. Yeah. And so if you want to see what is inside of this, 
um, there's an opportunity to sort of deconstruct the parts yeah. and see the individual elements over here. Yeah. And so, so we'll talk about the flow path and the ceramic ion transport membranes and the wafers and the cell stacks. So maybe you can grab this microphone. We'll okay. move on the back side of this All right. and we'll reset the, uh, the camera. So there's a there's sort of a theme yeah, to this. No, no, no worries. There's sort of a, a a theme to this meeting, and this and this broadcast is is you know we're meeting some milestones of of making oxygen. Yeah. And we keep asking ourselves if this is so great, why isn't this in hospitals already? And I think there's like there's like a three part four part answer for that. And the first part of if this is so great, why don't we have this already? Yeah, right. Um, it starts with this wafer. And so th these wafers are, um, you know, once you get the recipe down and, and you sort it out and you can make one reliably, yeah. you can make 10,000 reliably, but getting the first one is, is a tricky thing. Right. And, and this wafer is just amazing piece of technology. And um, what's going on with this wafer is it's a it's a relative it's about the size of you know cell, cell phone, phone right. and and maybe a third the thickness yeah the vast majority of this wafer really doesn't make oxygen it right. provides a strong structural support it's the foundation of this system and on top of this foundation there is a little lens of a porous material that does electrochemistry there is another lens of a strong impermeable rock that does electrochemistry, yeah. and then a porous layer on top <clears throat> that interacts with the air. And so if you put this in a warm environment and you blow air across, the moving air provides a fresh source of oxygen and it also sweeps the heat away. Yeah. Then, then if you have one of these things, the oxygen in the air um, will ionize into oxygen ions. The oxygen ions will move through the porous layer, through the solid rock, and into the little porous lens. And, and, the, and there, it, the oxygen ions will recombine into molecular oxygen, release an electron, and complete the electrical circuit. Right. So if you put this in a hot oven, you connect this up to a battery circuit, like, yeah. like a fifth grader making an elementary school project of connecting a DC battery to a, a incandescent light bulb, you can, you can take air and produce oxygen. The clever part about this wafer is that all of the oxygen collected in the lens migrates to the center port. You can glue together a stack of these wafers, and so all of the oxygen can come out of a single column. Right. And that, just all the engineering details of plumbing and, and seals uh, makes this all possible. You should show off this wafer, and I also believe that there's a, a animation. Yeah, you wanna, you a, wanna go over and, okay. and, and describe the animation? All right. So what we're looking at here is, is imagine one of these wafers, and as you can see in this particular diagram, the bulk of the material is this the black section here that John described on this, this drawing, and, and it's structurally, it's the structural member of this cell. And the thin layer here shown in red is the one that actually does the oxygen separation. And he pointed out that as the oxygen goes through, it gets collected into this gray layer here. That's the porous layer inside of it. And actually pressurized oxygen can build up in here. So if we sort of were to look as it proceeds through here, this is the main construction of it. and. In a moment, we'll see what happens if we imagine a slug of air coming across this individual cell here. Here we go. So the green dots represent oxygen and, and the blue, the nitrogen, is it's sweeping across here. The oxygen is selectively pulled out, comes across the membrane, goes into that porous layer, and because it's sealed and bonded on the exterior, the only way out is through this center hole that we see here in this particular uh, cell. Now, of course, we can stack up a whole series of these, and as the air sweeps across the, the group of them, individually, each one is extracting out oxygen. Its only way out is through the center port, and in this case, you know, we stack up a, a group as a standard uh, assembly, 30 of these individual cells, and 30 of these will make four liters per minute. In fact, we've got an example of one over here. John's got it here. 
So we we mount that it. into yeah, thank you. We mount that into a uh, rigid stainless steel box that gives it a lot of rigidity to it so that you can just cartridge load these into the box that John showed at the beginning of this. Air sweeps through this at very low back pressure. High pressure oxygen then comes out this particular pipe. So not only does it separate the oxygen, it compresses it simultaneously. So there's a second part of this answer. If this is so great, why don't we have it in oxygen, you know, medical oxygen using ion transport membranes already? Right. Um, 10 years ago, you built a cell stack very similar to this one. Yeah. And you operated it in Afghanistan under very harsh conditions. Right. And, and it worked reliably right. and the technology was great. Right. And yet 10 years later, it's not in the hospitals. Yeah. And, and that system, for the amount of oxygen that it produced, really required an impractical amount of electrical power. Right. And so the second part of this story is that compared to 10 years ago, the amount of power consumption that this device uses and, and right. black box uses right. is dramatically different. It's less and, than a third of what it was then. And, 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 and to demonstrate and describe that, again, we can't look inside the black box, but our friend and colleague Steve Fitzgerald did a hero's job of, of building a, a wind tunnel and managing the, the subtle details of airflow through a system. And if we look at his wind tunnel, yeah. I think you can sort of visualize, see what's inside of the black box in here. And this is one-to-one -one scale. And this is one-to-one exactly -one scale. What's so, inside. So, so what we're looking in here is from the perspective of the cell stacks and the perspective of the airflow path, right. this is the, the test article in there can support up to eight cell stacks. Right. We're going through one of these crawl, then walk, then run sequence. And so this summer, you did a set of testing with two cell stacks. Right. Right now, Tilk is leading an effort to, to measure four cell stacks. Right. And, and we're just, we'll just learning progress on about from the there. subtleties as, as we go about. You should look inside this just because like, we can't see inside the black box, but we can see inside Steve's wind tunnel. And so the process air inside that cell stack comes in through the bottom and goes through a heat exchanger and then comes in and comes in from the side, makes a hard hairpin turn, yep. and, and uh, presents sweeps itself, down it. sweeps yeah. in to a cell stack, and, and the, you know, the, the, the cell through the cell stack is quite open. 50% of the cross-sectional area is airflow path. Right. So this is, a, this is a straight, wide, flat duct, which is relatively open. And so the, a large amount of air sweeps across the system, a little bit of oxygen comes out the pipe, but the bulk of the process air is slightly heated right. and smoothly presented to another cell stack. Well, this one's a little warmer, so it works a little better. And this one is a little warmer and works a little better, and so on and so on. Right. By the time you get to the end of the process run, if you take that air and you sweep it around and put it into the heat exchanger, the heat exchanger can preheat the incoming air right. from the high temperature right. air to here That's right. so that you really don't need large heaters anymore. Right. And we don't want to talk about the details of making sure the air is smooth and uniform and it sweeps across, but I will give a shout out to Steve Fitzgerald who just did some beautiful stuff and, and you should show off and describe some of the details of the wind tunnel test. Yeah, so th this is you know this is some of the brilliance that uh, NASA brought to it and to the technology in order to reduce the amount of power to make a unit of oxygen and, and you can see in this this is actual from this mo um, this flow model here actual the fluid flow going through here so this is air flowing through it there's reflective particles and a laser illuminates these particles and you can see the actual flow stream of, of air as it moves through from one stack to another the little gaps in between um, and and the pattern that develops and what it shows is it's pretty smooth flow there's a few areas that we get some disruptions that we're surprised by so it was really enlightening to, to have this you know uh, yeah. these images of the actual flow with in the system because you can only model it so well and this gave us you know first hand 
understanding of it. Right. So, so again, this question, why are we here today and why are nerds so excited about today <laughs> is that, you know, there was a time when we had an idea and then there was a time we had a design. Right. And then there was a time we had a design that was backed up by an ambient temperature wind tunnel test. Right. And now we're flowing hot air through a big box. Right. And it hardly takes any fan power and it moves through the air. Right. And all of the cell stacks get the right amount of air and they're heating and they're moving just the way they should. In fact, here's the yeah. here's the, the the fan, the blower, yeah. literally that's running that unit. It's a small computer-sized fan, Couple and it pushes all the air through it. Yeah, comes out. Yeah, and so so it's the delight to manage all of the airflow with with Something the so one simple. moving part. Yeah. so small, so simple. Nothing else and, moving. And it's external. It's outside the system. Right. If if something happened, you could put in a spare. You could change out something. This one moving part really is uh, not part of the, you know, right. is, is an easy to uh, uh, replace, replace if required. Yeah. Right. And the rest of it is all solid state. There's no wear out mechanism never, in it. You never, uh, by design, you'd never break into the inside of the, of the box that's insulated and heated. Right. You, you right. just keep it forever. You know, you mentioned a little bit about the, the power efficiency. This unit running over here right now, you know, the, the stacks in there are doing all the heating of the air. So now that it's at operating temperature, the air comes in, is preheated by the heat exchanger, all, all the way up to it only needs another 50 watts to, to sort of control the temperature. And then all the other energy is done by, is waste heat from the oxygen separation process. And the cell stack is, reasonably efficient at yeah. these conditions. Right now, the, a, a, a cell stack like this that's producing four liters of oxygen is is consuming... It's it, like about 350 watts. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, I mean, that, that's, that's an efficient device. Yeah. And, and this is the part, well, oh, I'm holding this right now. This is the final part of the answer, why are we here today and why are we so excited? Um, we think that when this is built, Yeah and tested and shown to work and shown to meet all the requirements of purity, right? We just heard that it's pure gas. Production rate, we're seeing with our own two eyes, four liters of gas coming out of each one of these things. Power consumption, when sitting in here with the right amount, the electricity for the cell stack is affordable. Yeah. And pressure, earlier this week, you have uh, uh, all of the gas that comes out of here if you hooked up a, a hose and just delivered it to the room, like the bubbles right there, right. it would be at ambient pressure. Right. If you put a pressure regulator here and, and regulated the pressure to two atmospheres, five atmospheres delivery pressure, right. the performance would be essentially the same, right. and you can get pressurized gas That's right. um, w without any moving parts. Yeah, and it, uh, just yesterday we had, you know, we maxed out the back pressure regulator, went, to, you know, pinned it at 80 psi. The, the full flow is still coming out the the uh, oxygen discharge pipes. So it does all of its own compression. Again, there's no moving part. There's no mechanical compressor boosting that pressure up. It's all solid state. So pressure and scale, right? Pressure and scale are the things that we're interested in for sort of readiness and technology and why are we here today. I, I just want to call, you know, we were at the White Sands uh, test facility having a similar test about a year ago. And delivery pressure could not be demonstrated at the time because we were working out some manufacturing details. And full scale production could not be demonstrated at the time because the, the largest system that the manufacturing details were sorted out right. were these six liter, uh, six wafer cell stacks. Right. And so, so last time when we gave a talk, we said we're working, we're working as fast as we can, we still have some R&D to do. And now we really would like to say the R&D on this is done. That's done. And right. if, that, if the R&D is done, right. then if you wanted a larger scale system, a system with different requirements, right. you can build this system in a configuration that is larger and bigger. Right, right. I mean, uh, like, like the other day, you and I were considering how much, how many of these stacks would be needed to make, say, you know, uh, 18 and a half, cubic meters per hour. We did the calculation of that. And if you were to fill this sizes, tabletop yeah, the and just stack tabletop. those series if up, you, if you set it a like group this, of those, right. So so an we array get, of those stacks. So if we look at this tabletop, 
and think about of a little insulation on this side, a little insulation on that right. side, a right. heat exchanger below, a row right. of these. That system would be, you said, eight, eight, 18 and a half cubic meters yeah. per hour. Okay. So um, I'm looking at the time right now, and we want to finish on time. We said it was a 30 minute presentation and we'd go. Um, we've talked to people before, and, and um, anticipating some of the questions that people might have. I hope that this answers many questions, but raises some others. Yeah. And so, um, one, of the, uh, one of the questions I want to ask you, just on behalf of the people who are listening to this, All right. is like, so you tell me that this is insensitive to weather and temperature and pressure and elevation and humidity? Yes. Like really? It really Are you is. Really sure? I this mean, is like if I put this outside <laughs> in the in Houston, is you it know, still going to work? Um, a um, uh, an early earlier version of this uh, system was that was similar to this that had been developed by the the military um, was deployed to a, 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 um, a marine base in Afghanistan, and it was operated outside in, in scorching hot conditions and cold weather conditions. It literally went through dust storms there. Okay. Um, and we, we examined it after the fact. We were spooning out Afghanistan dirt out of the interior of it. It never failed to continue to operate. You know, the only reason it was it was decommissioned at one point is we had to replace a the thermocouple. And it just hadn't been designed to make that easily replaceable because it was an R&D unit at the time. But it ran nonstop throughout the all the cell stacks. It continued to run beautifully throughout okay. that whole process. You can, you can you can feed it with air that's 100% humidity. You could have a rainstorm surrounding you, you know, and it it just doesn't affect it. It's just not it, humidity just simply doesn't affect okay. the operation. Another question from the audience. Okay. Um, what happens if there's a loss of power? So, in the case of a loss of power, you know, that becomes an issue of how you want to design to it to re, to respond respond to that. Of course, the oxygen production will stop when there's a loss of power, but it doesn't cool off. It's got a considerable amount of thermal mass sitting in it. It just sort of sits there. When the, when the power is returned, you just turn the stacks back on. They begin producing oxygen again. It just, it just stops during when the power is out and then resumes when the power is restored. Okay. So if, if, if these cell stacks are inside a big box right. and you plug it into the wall and you have a fan and you draw room air in and you get oxygen out, you're also exhausting hot oxygen. Yeah. What, what, what do you have to do with the vent? What, what do you do with the vent here? So, you know, you could exploit that. There's the, the warm air coming out, the discharge of it is, is, is warm enough that you could heat a space for it if you wanted to. You could heat water with it. You could do whatever you want, you want to it. It's sort of waste, waste energy at that point because you've already made all the oxygen and you've recovered most of the energy to preheat the fresh coming, incoming air. But there's a little bit of warm air that's being discharged the same amount, more or less the same amount coming from this fan, but now it's warmer. Okay. And, and so you can use that for whatever purpose or you just discharge it into the atmosphere. Okay. Is this a medically certified device? No. You know, that, that will require the next steps, you know, because at this point, the stack, the core, the heart of the unit, that's been developed and ready. To, to get metal certification needs, you know, the engagement of the, of the um, community that would write those certifications because it's a whole new technology. It's not the way auction is produced today. It's a completely different methodology that will require its own certifications. Okay. We're going to be blunt here, right? Because, we, you know... I you work in a small company, I work for NASA. Um, NASA will support the technical work for a new standard, just like John Tilka supports ASTM standards on oxygen safety. We'll do the technical work because it's a benefit of, of NASA. But if there's a new medical standard, the, the, the global health community will want to be part of that, right. want to bake in. Right. And, and we want to say that if you've got one of these things and you're making oxygen and it's reliable, right. this is the time to like really pivot and, and start that work. You know, with that you bring up an important point. One of the advantages of this technology is it only makes oxygen. So as a reminder, you know, this is the thing pushing the air through. So if you've got 50 PSI oxygen coming out, there's only one way you manage to get that. And it's because you had this electrochemical process that made the oxygen. It didn't come from this blower because it's at 50 PSI. Right. 
So you can be certain if you've got a, a source of compressed gas, in this case compressed oxygen, you can be certain it's it's more than a hundred times more pure than the medical requirements. It'll exceed 99.99%. It's you know, and it's always there. You never there's never a question on its purity. So so the pressure verifies if it, right if you're a medical doctor right. and you see the tank has pressure. There's only one way it got that, there. That it is absolutely medical grade or better. Right. Because of just the way the right. system works. It literally will exceed the specifications by more than 100x. Okay. Yeah. No, I get it. That's an important point. Um, can I buy one? <laughs> Next week. No. No, you can't. I mean, really what, uh, in order to, to buy one today, what really is required at this point is the development of that stack is now complete. So now the next step, logical step, is the scale up the manufacturing of that stack and now designing specific product specific devices. So, you know, there's this test device we're running in here, sure. which is a test platform for these series of stacks. But the next logical step is to take the operational stack, this boxed up drop in unit, and configure that the number of those units into a product that meets a particular set of specifications that a customer needs to define. Sure. You're like, how much oxygen do I need? How much pressure do I need? You know, what sort of operating conditions do I want to run it at? Those are now the engineering requirements or specifications that need to come from the community as to what they need. And then the system can be designed around, engineered around it, but the, the part that was the most difficult part in terms of timing to get complete was to come up with that stack and now that's done. So now those just they just drop in, you design the rest of the system around it. Okay. And that's more straightforward engineering. Okay, so the last question is, is just a restatement of this central question because lots of people, are, this, this is the central question for people who are looking at this, says yeah congratulations there's a bunch of bubbles but that bubbles are still a minuscule amount of amount. Right. So let's just say that again as, as the last thing. Right. Even though the amount of bubbles there is not very much. Right. You're still ready to make large amounts of oxygen. Right. Because if you can make if you can make 10 of these you can make 10,000. Right. And if you line them up in a row thoughtfully and put these things side by side, right. you right. can make larger systems. Right. You know, you can make an analogy to, to the difference. You've got the transistor and then you have to make a computer, but you had to first get the transistor. You know, so now you've got the, the main building block and you just need to start to arrange that into what system you want to make to meet the a particular product specification. Okay. Okay. No, nope, I get it. Well, we're close to time and I, I want to do three things to close. Um, the first is we want to say thank you to all the people that are making this possible. If we individually thanked all the people on MCOG and the live stream, it'd take 30 minutes just to say thank you, but thank you. <laughs> Um, the, the second thing is, I, I hate to be blunt, right, right, we, we really want to say that this is the thing, right? right. This is the thing, this thing didn't exist right. when we had a similar meeting 14 months ago. Right. Right. This thing exists now. Right. And if this thing exists... And it literally just drops in and, and it drops in and it's shown to work in that system, right. Right. Then, then you really can have serious conversations about using this for for welder's oxygen, right. but also for medical oxygen. Right. Yep. Then the, the last thing we just want to do, you know, we didn't have a mechanism to like put questions into a chat or something like that, but if, if, if you step out, really, we hope that this answered some of the questions you have, but raised some others. And so if, you know, if we start some partnerships, we have a dialogue or something like that, you should want to reach out. Yeah. And so I encourage you to, um, uh, send us an email note and we'll field and, and we'll connect. So, congratulations. Th th it's just congratulations to you. Piece. It wouldn't yeah. happen without and, NASA. And thank you for everybody at White Sands to make that happen. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you.